First in our series has been uh, 1 Peter 3 and 15. This is, the, this is the foundation of the whole series. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you or in you with meekness and fear. So get a hold of a right relationship with God and then be prepared and studied so that you have an answer when the world asks, why do you do the way you do? Why do you live the way you live, etc.? But, but you not, you, we, we can answer things, but we have to do it with meekness and fear and a right spirit. Amen. So that's the theme of the whole thing. Then parts one and two, we talked about Christian ethics. Part three uh, was uh, what, what is your worldview? Part four, uh, I've got a lot of comments on, but we talked about what happened to us. And uh, we talked about how America kind of came to where it is. And one thing that I think we have done, if you bring up slide two, uh, we, have, um, we have certainly made the argument that the Scripture argues for a biblical worldview. All right, so that's what I'm teaching from tonight. And we've been using the, uh, a good definition that comes from Alan Branch. It says, Christian ethics is the study of right and wrong in which the God of the Bible is taken as the ultimate source of moral authority. And it investigates moral questions and makes moral recommendations from the perspective of a Christian worldview. And everybody said amen to that. And uh, some you can call it a Christian worldview. Uh, most often people refer to it as a biblical worldview. So tonight we're in the series Engaging Culture. Tonight I'm going to move all the way to verse 5 and we're going to deal with a real hot button topic uh, in our culture that's going on today. If you bring up slide 3, I want to talk tonight about abortion distortion. I want to talk to you tonight because there's a lot of things about abortion and the arguments for and pro and all. There's been a lot of truth that's been distorted, a lot of misinformation. And what I want to do is tonight teach from a biblical perspective and give the saints an understanding of why the church takes the position it does and to give you some things to help you not only understand but help you to explain to others, amen, so that we can be salt and light to this culture, amen. Now, I'm well aware that there are people probably in this building as, as well as you know, watching online uh, and so forth that have may have had abortions. I want you to understand what I'm teaching tonight is in no way endeavoring to make anybody feel bad about anything. Um, you know, if you have repented of your sin and come before God, the blood of Jesus can, can wash you and all that. So that we're not teaching from any condemnation sense tonight. Uh, this is for an educational sense, all right? I want you to help you understand we have to walk with God in this world that we're in. And right now, this is a whirlwind. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray. In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you for your presence here. and We're going into your word tonight. And we ask you to help guide us in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Would you clap your hands to the Lord one more time? And before you're seated, wave, greet, shake hand, whatever, with three or four people around you. Be seated in the name of the Lord. I, uh, I feel that as a modern-day pastor uh, it, and, and bishop of the church, it's important to address critical issues that are dividing the nation. We dealt with this quite a bit a couple of years ago when I was having some pastor's roundtables with some of the young people and so forth. Uh, but I never really came to the church and talked about it, that I remember anyway. Um, maybe it's good to understand, say, well, what does this have to do with the Bible? Well, you know, the truth is there is no new thing under the sun. And uh, humanity just keeps repeating itself over and over again. And, and even when we consider how many lives are taken with abortion in the modern world, and quite frankly, mostly in America, um, you have to understand when you go back in history, there's nothing really new about child sacrifice. Uh, it goes back into the early days of the Old Testament, and in my opinion, I feel like that's what modern abortion is. It's a modern version, and it's driven by the exact same spirits that drove it back throughout history. And I don't really have time. By the way, I, I'm telling you, I, I have enough information and things I could talk about on this. I literally could be here till midnight, and that is no exaggeration. I mean, I've got that much to teach. I don't have till midnight. 
Uh, so what I want to do is I want to try to skip a lot of things and bring it down to a, a, a compendium, you know, of, of thought, because I don't necessarily want to go into a second session, but I'm hoping to get this one done. Here's the bottom line. As the people of God and as the church, we have to, uh, we have to come to a conclusion about something. We have to come to a conclusion about is there any intrinsic value to a human being? Uh, we call it, and you've heard it called, the sanctity of life. Well, really, the issue of the sanctity of human life is really what this issue is all about. Either we have value or we do not have value. Is a human being more sacred than any other kind of creature, any of the animals or anything else that's on this planet? Uh, and, and from a biblical worldview, the question is, what value does God, as our creator, place on human life because that's where our morality needs to come from it comes from for for the people of God it comes from scripture which we believe comes from God and if human life is sacred and this is this is really kind of where where it goes then it affirms that life is is the ultimate it's of ultimate importance uh, for all of us and life is valuable no matter what stage you're in no matter what age you are no matter what handicap I'm walking around like a 100-year-old man with these bone spurs in my spine, and yet i got to tell you from a biblical per perspective, I'm just as valuable as I was a year ago. <laughs> now, I may not be as useful as I was, <laughs> but I'm, I'm as valuable. So it doesn't, matter what, what, it doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter what your race is. You see, this actually kind of touches a lot of things that's going on in our culture, but but it should not be, it, because life, if life has value, then it should not be ended prematurely or carelessly without biblical warrant. There, the, this, the scripture gives some instances where uh, taking a life is, is uh, uh, permitted, and we don't have time to get into that. We may cover that in another session. But what we're talking about tonight is that the right to life is, comes from a biblical worldview, the basis that it is the basis, actually, of all human rights in a civilized society. Let me give you some Bible standpoints. Let's bring up Genesis chapter 1, go all the way into the beginning of time, our beginning of humanity, and we ask ourselves, does a human being have value? Uh, I think we do, and the reason is because we were made in the image of God. We are not a fluke of evolution. And not, you know, you've heard me say this, people haven't been evolving. They keep sketching all these monkeys and things, but I'm seeing nothing change. And, and, and his, history, through history, we got no pictures of anything changing into the, and the animal world isn't really changing into things. It, it, some minor little issues are not enough to prove the point. But Genesis 1 and 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Now this was not just talking about Adam and Eve, though, though it was, but it, it, even going beyond that, it's talking about humanity as a whole. But God started it by making Adam and Eve. From that point on, humanity was made in a partnership between God and between people, parents, that would foster children. Um, Zechariah chapter 12, a verse we don't use a lot, but the Bible says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel is this, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of a man within him. So God not only created us as people and gave us the carbon footprint, so to speak, that of what we are physically, but we have within us the spirit that is within us. We have, we, well, as a matter of fact, the Bible says God breathed into us. And uh, is the devil getting mad already? <laughs> The same God who created us warned us about murder and about not murdering. Uh, now, why would he do that? Because our value is intrinsic from our maker. Our value is not based on our education. It's not based on our money. It's not based on our talents or our abilities or anything else. The least among us is just as valuable as the greatest among us as far as their value is before God. 
Genesis 9 and 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, then by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. The, the premise, God himself made the premise that the reason we are not permitted to murder is because life, human life, has value. And it's a value that should never be touched. Now, because we're made in the image of God, uh, we will never obviously have all of God's attributes, but we are certainly made to be a reflection of God. And we are the only thing that he created in the earth that was designed to reflect his glory. Genesis 2 and 7 on screen. The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. It is at this point when God elevated humanity above all of the other kingdoms, the, the, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the mineral kingdom. Everything that God had created, uh, it all has value and it all has purpose. But nothing in the earth has an eternal soul attached to it. You know, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I hate to tell you, but, you know, the dog and the cat and stuff we love, we love our pet, but they're not going to be in heaven with us. But I'll tell you this, you're not going to worry about that if you make it to heaven. <laughs> you won't even remember Fido if you can get in his presence and his glory. <laughs> But the point of that simply is they have life and they're created by God as well. But they're not attached with a soul. God did not elevate them to the level of humanity. And if we elevate them to the level of humanity, we're getting things a little out of sorts. So we've got to stay a little balanced. So as a consequence of being in God's balance, we have a spiritual life and we have moral obligations and duties that is not necessarily that was given to the animal world. We have ethical sensitivities. We, we alone have the ability to represent God. We can do it well or we can do it poorly, but, but, but we are to echo Him. Humanity is connected directly to God, and no matter what handicap, no matter what our situation, um, I, I'm... I'm I know I'm kind of maybe repeating this, but I need to get it through to you. Life is not less valuable just because you're sickly or because you're uneducated or because you've had a setback or whatever the case may be. Now, I know when we're going through sickness and time, especially sometimes we get to old age and I, I hear people say, well, I'm just not useful anymore. And I, You know, yes, we go through seasons where we can't do what we used to do when we were young. And so forth. But don't, don't make the mistake of attaching what you're able to do or not do as to what your value is. That's, that's what I'm trying to get across. And, and as a matter of fact, that's why this, this issue of the sanctity of life touches on a lot of other hot button issues, too. For example, euthanasia. Uh, euthanasia is contrary to a biblical worldview for the exact same reason it's, it's murder. Okay? Now, let me show you how valuable human life was. Bring up Luke chapter 1, verse 34. The, the angel of the Lord came and visited Mary. You know this verse. It's the Christmas season. And Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be? He told her, You're going to have a child, etc. Seeing how I know not a man. She's still a virgin. And the angel answered and said, The Holy Ghost. By the way, that's the answer to everything we can't understand. The Holy Ghost will, hate, will take care of it. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, everybody say therefore. <clears throat> now watch closely. This is one of my favorite verses. Therefore also that holy thing. It, just, it just cracks me up that the angel called it a holy thing. Which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now why was it holy? It was holy because God was coming in the form of a human being. What made it holy was that a child was, was conceived and in its mother's womb. And, and, and of course, in Jesus' case, it's because the Spirit of God was his soul. But my point is, is that, that even the angel said it was holy and valuable from the beginning. He, he said, it, it, it's, not, it's going to be in you. It's already holy. It's already So the idea that, that it's nothing until it's born is ridiculous. The sanctity of life is also promoted in the idea of the Ten Commandments, 
when you come down to the sixth commandment, we've been talking about it, thou shalt not <coughs> kill. Well, the reality is that verse uh, probably would be better in modern terms to say thou shalt not murder. Uh, it's just a wholly different thing. Uh, and so the commandment underscores that every human life has a right to life. Literally. And Jesus strengthened the sixth commandment all the way in the New Testament. Bring up Matthew 21, 5 and 21. <clears throat> and ye have heard that it has been said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Jesus himself here now is referencing the, the sixth commandment and the, the rulings that went with it by the rabbis. But then he says in verse 22, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. You know, sometimes when we say we got an anger problem, we better take it serious and get it to the book because this is the kind of stuff that ha this is why mass shootings happen. This is why all kinds of craziness is going on in our world. And Jesus was literally saying that, you know, the, the time to deal with the value of life is not uh, just when it is conceived, uh, but you need to deal with those things before they get so uh, to a level where you take somebody's life. He said, Whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Jesus was moving the, the line of offense from just the action to the motive. And he said, we've got to clean up our motive before we go doing something crazy. Does that make sense? So when I say the term sanctity of life, it, it, in our current culture, in the 21st century, it, it's a political catchword that most everybody recognizes immediately to be attached with the pro-life movement. And the Bible has a distinguished moral code that says humans have a great value and a great purpose and I want to show you something else about Jesus because nothing underscores the value of a human life more than John 3.16. If you bring it up. For God so loved the world. He wasn't talking about the planet. He was talking about the people. He didn't die for, for our dog and cat and cattle. He didn't die for the horse and the, and the, and the camel. And the, he died for humanity. Can you say humanity? And he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God came in flesh to provide a salvation for his creation. Now here's my point. If you ever wondered what the value of a human being is, uh, you just read it right there. That's how much God values you and I. And, and sometimes we, we get into conflicts with people and, and, oh, I just can't stand with it. But I'm going to tell you something. They're just as valuable to God as you are. Because our value is not always connected to what we do. Our value is connected to what we are. Our worldview, therefore, is what determines our politics. It's, what's, it's what determines our uh, thinking on how we see the world and so forth. So what I'm going to do tonight on this topic as I'm going to lean a little more heavily than I would ever usually do on some AV uh, additions. And I've got three videos that I'm going to show you tonight, uh, briefer clips. One's just about five minutes or so. But uh, I want to show you uh, one from Dennis Prager, who uh, most of you know him from Prager University, the videos and stuff. But he is a Jew. He's a practicing Jew. He is not a Christian. And he'll, he'll tell you that, but he is a Jew, but he fully understands the value and the connection of Judaism and Christianity. He understands very well with wisdom how that Judeo-Christian uh, philosophy has affected the world and how the world is in places where it's not. And it's being attacked in America like no time in our history. This is about a five-minute video. I'm going to let Dennis Prager explain uh, this issue well because... Quite frankly, I couldn't say it any better. Are you more valuable than a dog or a cat or, for that matter, a tree? One of the biggest differences between Judeo-Christian values and secular values concerns this very issue, the worth of the human being. According to the Judeo-Christian value system, human beings are infinitely valuable. 
On the other hand, secular humanism devalues the worth of humans. As ironic as it may sound, the God-based Judeo-Christian value system renders humans infinitely more valuable than any humanistic value system. The reason is simple. If there is no God, human beings are only material beings, and therefore not worth anything beyond the matter of which they are composed. But in the Judeo-Christian system, human beings are created in the image of God, meaning that human life is sacred. In other words, we are either created in the image of carbon atoms, and therefore not worth much more than carbon, or we are created in the image of God, and therefore infinitely valuable. Our secular post-Judeo-Christian society has rendered human beings less significant than at any time in Western history. First, the secular denial that human beings are created in God's image has led to humans increasingly being equated with animals. That's why, over the course of 30 years of asking high school and college students if they would first try to save their dog or a stranger, two-thirds have always voted against the person. They either don't know what they would do, or they actually vote for the dog. And many adults now vote similarly. Why? There are two reasons. One is that, with the denial of the authority of higher values, such as religious teachings, people increasingly make moral decisions on the basis of how they feel. And since just about everybody feels more for their dog than for a stranger, many people simply choose the dog. The other reason is that once you get rid of Judeo-Christian values, there's no reason for elevating human worth over that of an animal. That's why people estranged from Judeo-Christian values, including many Jews and Christians, support programs such as Holocaust on Your Plate. Holocaust on Your Plate is a campaign developed by the animal rights group People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, that teaches that there is no difference between the barbecuing of chickens in America and the burning of Jews in the Holocaust. Why? Because a human and a chicken are of equal worth. So too, in a notorious Tucson, Arizona case, a woman screamed to firefighters that her three babies were in the burning house. Thinking that the woman's children were trapped inside, the firefighters risked their lives to save the woman's three cats. If you think these two examples are either just theoretical, the dog stranger question, or extreme, the Tucson mother of cats, here's an issue that is neither theoretical nor extreme. More and more people believe, as PETA does, that even if it would lead to a cure for cancer or AIDS, it would be wrong to experiment on animals. In fact, many animal rights advocates believe that even to save a human life, it would be wrong to kill a pig to obtain a heart valve. The 20th century showed vividly what happens to human worth when Judeo-Christian values are abandoned. Nazi Germany and the various communist regimes all rejected Judeo-Christian values and ended up slaughtering the largest number of people in human history. For Nazism, Jews and members of other non-Aryan groups were declared worthless and murdered in the millions. For communists, human worth was determined solely by communist parties which murdered tens of millions of people. Only by rejecting Judeo-Christian values could Nazis declare Jews, Slavs, and others subhuman. And only by rejecting Judeo-Christian values could communist regimes slaughter those they called class enemies. Individual human life meant nothing. Meanwhile, human slavery was abolished only in the Judeo-Christian world. And of course, for nearly all those who reject Judeo-Christian values, the human fetus is worthless, if its mother deems it so. Finally, there is an increasingly vocal part of the environmentalist movement that also denigrates human worth. For these individuals, the human being is not infinitely precious. Trees and rivers 
and mountains are. So, are you more valuable than a dog or a cat or a tree? That depends on your value system. I'm Dennis Prager. That's excellent. You can see why I shared it with you. I really, really enjoy uh, Mr. Prager. He is, like I said, he's a practicing Jew. He's not a Christian, but he has, by his own testimony, has great, great respect uh, for the original Judeo-Christian viewpoint. So I encourage you at times, you can go onto YouTube and type in Prager U, and you can find all kinds of topics that are taught from that worldview, <coughs> or what we used to call common sense. <laughs> but it's no longer common anymore. And I had to chuckle when he, he brought in PETA, because uh, they're located right here in Norfolk, right downtown is their headquarters, if you didn't know it. That we used to call it PETA, people embarrassing the Tidewater area. <laughs> Because they just, they just go so nutty extreme, you know. I love animals. I've had pets in my life. I don't, I don't arbitrarily just kill animals. I love them. But, but they do take it to such an extreme that when you start thinking barbecuing your chicken is the same as killing a human being, there's something gone wrong in your value system. That's the point I'm trying to say. You see, ultimately, a Christian worldview or a biblical worldview is central to being able to evaluate things morally, at least particularly from God's standpoint. So if you and I embrace a biblical worldview, then it's able to give us direction on how to solve uh, other issues besides abortion. Uh, Issues like uh, euthanasia and racism and human trafficking and violent crimes and artificial life technologies. All of these things come into and give us direction already because when you decide that that the Bible is correct on this and we are valuable simply because God made us and he declared us valuable. He put his spirit in us. Uh, That is what gives us the ability to target all these other issues that would not be there nearly as right or nearly as strong if we were practicing a biblical worldview. And I do want to point out, not not every church practices a, a Christian worldview. Not every Christian has a biblical worldview. As he said, not every Jew has a biblical worldview. But we have got to get maintained. The church has, and the saints here in Norfolk, we've got to have a biblical worldview to deal with the world that we're in. And respecting the value of life is ultimately how we're going to be able to obey one of the things that Jesus told us to do. Bring up Matthew 22 and 37 on screen. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thine soul and with all thy mind. And that verse alone can keep you quite busy. We amen that one uh, because that is the first and great commandment. But it's verse 39 is a little tougher to deal with. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You know what Jesus was literally saying? Jesus was literally saying, if you understand the value of life and you believe in the sanctity of life and, 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 and have a, a right worldview on it, that becomes the basis of why I have to get things right with my neighbor. Why I have to love one another, regardless of race. Regardless. You see how many issues it touches on? It's amazing how that one worldview issue changes everything. And, and that verse is only possible if you value life the way God told us to value it. The sanctity of life has a high priority and a preeminence when it comes to Christian ethics because, and, and I want to underline this in your mind, listen to this. We want to talk about rights and people's rights and human rights and all this other thing. But listen, uh, if, if, if they cannot exercise the right to life, they can't exercise any other right. The right to life is a basic and <clears throat> preeminent law from God. And even America's Constitution and our founding documents is kind of interesting because <clears throat> there's so much revisionist history going on right now to try to say that uh, the early founders of the nation you know, didn't, had no Christian values and all that. This entire governmental setup that we have was based on biblical Judeo-Christian values. And in the, in the Declaration of Independence itself, the famous words we quote all the time, we hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, common sense. This shouldn't, this shouldn't even be up for, 
for argument, but we're going to say it anyway, that all men are created equal. Everybody say created. We didn't evolve into being equal. We were created equal, talking about our value. That they are endowed with their creator. Everybody say creator. With certain unalienable rights. That among these, and it lists three before it goes on to some other topics, but, but three of them that were listed right up front, the first one that was a right was we have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Because none, other, none of the other rights matter if you don't have a right to life. So it's a foundational issue. Well, pastor, what about a woman's right to choose? Well, that sounds noble. But it's not really as noble as it sounds. At first it kind of makes sense, you know. And we have a lot of people that say, well, you know, I, I'm against abortion, but I'm, I'm in favor for a woman's right to choose. Well, here's the thing. We all have certain rights. And we say, I want the right to choose. Okay, well, all of us have the right to choose things. A number of things we could talk about. But here's what you need to understand. Does a woman have a right to choose? Yes. But that is not an overriding right. Your and I's right to choose this, that, or the other path does not override God's laws that were foundational. And the right to life is a foundational law that comes from God. And our opinions do not override the reality of our creation from a biblical worldview. And so this is not a woman's health issue. I get so tired of, of hearing that all the time, especially in these modern times. It is very, very seldom that that, uh, that that is a health issue per se. But here's the thing. That baby that is inside of a woman is, is not, uh, it is, <laughs> she said, I have a right to my own body. Yes, but this is in your body. It is not your body. And we know this because once that child is conceived, we know it scientifically without any question nowadays. And that is because that child, when a woman is pregnant, that child from conception on begins in those first few days and weeks. It develops a brand new DNA. It is a separate individual by God's creation. And, and so... We, our right to you know, convenience or what does not override God's rights. There's an old saying, your right to swing your fist ends at the edge of my nose. <laughs> so so you, you, can swing, you can swing it all around all you want and nobody's going to bother. But if you cross a line, we're going to have to deal with you. And so a woman does have a right to choose, but only up to the line that God has drawn and said the right to life is greater than our right to our opinion about something. And as saints of God, who, by the way, are going to inherit the earth, I want to remind you, we are obligated to align our personal politics as people of God and align them up with Scripture, not our, not our mother or father or uncles or aunts and whatever. Doesn't matter. Old things pass away. And behold, all things become new. The problem with many modern saints sometimes is we don't let everything, we just want to keep salvation in, as just the only thing that, that we just want to go to heaven. We don't want it to affect any other thing. That's not what God had in mind. And, and so we've got to align ourselves up with Scripture. So a question comes up, well, what about a personal conviction? What, what can, uh, can I personally be pro-life and yet, you know, endorse pro-choice stuff? I have another three-minute or so video that addresses that have question. Have you ever Enjoy heard, this. I'm pro-life, but I don't want to impose my beliefs on others? Or, I'm personally opposed to abortion, but I just can't take away somebody else's choice to have one. The reality is, if we acknowledge that abortion takes the life of a human being, then we should be opposed to all abortions. Every innocent human being has a right to not be killed. And that's why we can't just be personally pro-life. Those who are personally pro-life, in an effort to be fair towards other people's views, are actually putting forth a view that's very unfair. Under this view, their own pre-born children have human life and human rights, but other people's children may not. If a person is going to be personally pro-life and grant their own pre-born children the right to life, then shouldn't they grant that right to every other pre-born child? 
a person would never say that they only personally oppose child abuse. They never say, well, I would never abuse a child myself, but I can't take away a parent's right to abuse their own kids. It wouldn't make any sense. But if the preborn are human beings, then abortion is the ultimate form of child abuse. Or imagine if somebody said, I'm personally against slavery, but I wouldn't stop anybody else from owning slaves. Or, I'm personally against the Nazi Holocaust, but I can't stop somebody else from persecuting Jews. We'd think they were terribly confused or even cowardly. The right to life is the number one right that we the people have promised to protect, along with liberty and the pursuit of happiness. If our laws do not protect the right to life, then they're failing their most basic function. So it's actually impossible to be just personally pro-life. We either believe in the right to life for all human beings, or we don't. Some of those who call themselves personally pro-life think that to oppose abortion means taking away the rights of other people. But that's completely upside down. No one should think that they have the right to kill an innocent human being, especially if that human being is their own child. To oppose abortion is to protect children from having their most fundamental rights taken away. Since Roe v. Wade, over 60 million children have been killed by abortion. Let that sink in. 60 million human lives. And these lives continue to be killed every day in our country, in our states, in our cities. For many of us, it's happening down the street from our homes. This is the greatest civil rights crisis of our time, and we can't just sit on the sidelines. This is why I've dedicated my life to ending abortion and building a culture of life. All of us need to do everything that we can to protect innocent life, from educating one another on the reality of life in the womb, to exposing the horror of the abortion industry, to giving charitably to support new mothers and fathers, to ministering outside of abortion mills, to opening our homes to children that need foster care or adoption, and vote. Vote with your ballots. Vote with your dollars. Make the pro-life position heard with posts on social media. Together, we can create a community where abortion is rejected and every human life is loved and cherished. Amen. It is a marvel to me to watch in our modern culture the passion in which people will fight to defend abortion. They'll, they'll scream, they'll yell, they'll, they'll this. And really the answer to it is not to fuss with the culture about abortion itself. It is that we have to re-educate culture. Whatever influence any of us have, we have to educate them about the value of life. Everyone that I've ever heard interviewed on this topic, uh, talking about a lot of women and stuff, they, they have convinced themselves, I think conveniently, that the thing that is in them is not really human. They're not really killing. Well, what's happened is, over time, this thing has gotten more vicious and more vicious. And what, what was, well, you could have an abortion up until so many weeks, and then, then it turned into so many months. And now there are states that have it all the way up to, 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 to birth. And so think about this for a moment. If you're in a state where it's legal, a baby is in his mother's womb, is... Um, uh, you know, covered by rights, or not covered by rights, but, but 10 minutes later when it's outside of the womb, all of a sudden now it's a human. That doesn't make any logical sense whatsoever. And this past year, Roe v. Wade, after 49 years, was overturned, and it should have been. It should have never been law to start with. It was based on a faulty premise. Many people argued that from the beginning. Activist judges back in the 1970s uh, created a new right, so to speak, between the lines. It was never there. The Constitution never addressed abortion other than the, the value of, of life. And <clears throat> since that time, and I want you to think about this, Roe v. Wade happened in 1973. Most states' uh, abortion was outlawed in America at the time. Some states it, it was. It was estimated in 1973 that about a half a million illegal abortions were happening in the country. So, you know, sin is still going to happen. But let me show you what the problem is when you codify or codify sin. Codify. My wife's always on me there, which one it is. 
She's gotten into my head. <laughs> Time I say the word, uh oh, where's she at? <laughs> codify, codify. I got to remember that. <clears throat> uh, now, look what happened. A half a million estimated abortions was happening in America in 1973. By two years later, after it was made, abort- made a federal law, which overrode all the state's rights, and it forced abortion down the throats of everyone, whether they wanted it or not. And most states didn't want it. In two years' time, the amount of abortions jumped from half a million to a million babies a year were being aborted. And that has continued to slide slowly up over time. About a million and a half per year are, are, are being aborted now. Uh, that's 4,000 a day in America alone. And since 1973, which you heard on the video, 60 million approximate babies have been aborted. That is every 26 seconds in America another child is aborted. And, and if you want to really talk about something that we'll get into a little more in a minute, it, it predominantly affects the black community, the African-American community, more than any other cult subculture. And that shouldn't be a shock because Margaret Sanger, who was the founder of Planned Parenthood, was quoted at one time saying that was the first original goal. She was a racist. And racist people founded that organization. And they made their monies off of abortion. Don't it wasn't breast exams and pap, pap, you know, exams. That's not what they were fighting for. We're fighting for women's health. No, they were fighting to kill babies because it's big money, <laughs> and that's what it was. So, for perspective, <clears throat> the state of California right now has just under 40 million people in population, 39 plus some. Uh, that means that since Roe v. Wade until now. We have killed California 1.5 times in the past 49 years. Let that sink in. And at this point, probably only about, if we had not had Roe v. Wade for that time, it, and, the, and the old numbers had stayed in place, by this time that number would probably only be about 24 million over the last 49 years. But when you codify sin, and you take away the value of life, you open the floodgates for all kinds of things to come in. And the left screams about this, my body, my choice. Uh, okay, but it, again, it, it isn't your body. It's in your body. A baby has a separate life. It has a separate DNA. And that baby, according to God, has a right to life. And, only, and, and we make the argument, well, what about you know, rape or incest? And all? Okay, even if you, even if you uh, allow it for that, that only makes up less than 1% of all abortions that are taking place. You wouldn't even notice the difference in the numbers. All canceling, and, and I, when, when Roe v. Wade was overturned, I marveled, and I saw this coming for, for a long time. I've, I said it was going to be because you know, I saw the trends of what was happening. You know, the irony is slowly on the abortion issue, uh, pro-life is winning the argument, slowly but surely. But all canceling Roe v. Wade did was, was it didn't outlaw abortions. It just took off the federal boot off of, off of the neck of the nation and sent it back to all the state-level governments, which is where it should have been to start with. Mm-hmm. So each state now can choose to allow abortion or not allow abortion or put whatever you know, levels on it that they want, and the states can, can figure it out. That's what should have been happening all along. <clears throat> Many states rolled it back already. Some have already taken motion. Some had things ready within weeks of when Roe v. Wade was, uh, was overturned because that's how passionate people are on both sides of the thing. So a lot of states put their foot on the brake, but a lot of other states put their foot on the gas. <laughs> and states like California and New York are, are, are getting almost uh, rabid about it. California is now offering abortion tourism. And they're saying that they'll even help pay the expenses of you to come to California to get your abortion. And it proclaims reproductive freedom. But the irony is they're not fighting for your right to reproduce. They're fighting. If you want to learn something about government, whatever the name of these bills are, it's, it's always deceptive. Good rule of thumb is take whatever it is, turn it upside down, and then you'll have an idea what the bill really is. <laughs> because there's so much deception in it. Um, <clears throat> So <laughs> they're not fighting for this. Now, again, I got one more I want to share with you. Dennis Prager, uh, one last video I want to share. T- 
talks about let's the moral talk about arguments concerning abortion because the question really is is abortion moral one of the this most emotionally charged subjects there is abortion but in an unemotional way also let's not touch on the question that most preoccupies discussion of the subject whether abortion should be legal or illegal. The only question here is the moral one. Is ending the life of a human fetus moral? Let's begin with this question. Does the human fetus have any value and any rights? Now, it's a scientific fact that a human fetus is human life. Those who argue that the human fetus has no rights say that a fetus is not a person but even if you believe that, it doesn't mean the fetus has no intrinsic value or no rights. There are many living beings that are not persons that have both value and rights. Dogs and other animals, for example. And that's moral argument number one. A living being doesn't have to be a person in order to have intrinsic moral value and rights. When challenged with this argument, People usually change the subject to the rights of the mother, meaning the right of a mother to end her fetus's life under any circumstance for any reason and at any time in her pregnancy. Is that moral? It is only if we believe that the human fetus has no intrinsic worth. But in most cases, nearly everyone believes that the human fetus has essentially infinite worth and an almost absolute right to live. When? When a pregnant woman wants to give birth. Then society and its laws regard the fetus as so valuable that if someone were to kill that fetus, that person could be prosecuted for homicide. Only if a pregnant woman doesn't want to give birth do many people regard the fetus as worthless. Now, does that make sense? It doesn't seem to. Either a human fetus has worth, or it doesn't. And this is moral argument number two. On what moral grounds does the mother alone decide a fetus's worth? We certainly don't do that with regard to a newborn child. It is society, not the mother or the father, that determines whether a newborn child has worth and a right to live. So the question is, why should that be different before the human being is born? Why does one person, a mother, get to determine whether that being has any right to live? People respond by saying that a woman has the right to control her body. Now that is entirely correct. The problem here, however, is that the fetus is not her body. It is in her body. It is a separate body. And that's moral argument number three. No one ever asks a pregnant woman, how's your body, when asking about the fetus? People ask, how's the baby? Moral argument number four. Virtually everyone agrees that the moment the baby comes out of the womb, killing the baby is murder. But deliberately killing it a few months before birth is considered no more morally problematic than extracting a tooth. How does that make sense? And finally, moral argument number five. Aren't there instances in which just about everyone, even among those who are pro-choice, would acknowledge that an abortion might not be moral? For example, would it be moral to abort a female fetus solely because the mother prefers boys to girls? as has happened millions of times in China and elsewhere? And one more example. Let's say science develops a method of determining whether a child in the womb is gay or straight. Would it be moral to kill a gay fetus because the mother didn't want a gay child? People may offer practical reasons not to criminalize all abortions. People may differ about when personhood begins and about the morality of abortion after rape or incest. But with regard to the vast majority of abortions, those of healthy women aborting a healthy fetus, let's be clear, most of these abortions just aren't moral.
Good societies can survive people doing immoral things. But a good society cannot survive if it calls immoral things moral. I'm Dennis Prager. Mr. Prager's this last point is very powerful. <clears throat> a good society can't survive if it's calling moral things, immoral things, moral. Now, <clears throat> long before he said it, Isaiah, the prophet, chapter 5, verse 20 on screen, said, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We live in a day that that is exactly what is taking place in our American culture. And extremists are coming out of the closet like they're not even, they're not even hiding it anymore. <laughs> Crazy stuff is coming out. Openly denying things that are just common sense. There is actually a group that's pushing this now and believes that this ought to be uh, embraced by young children and stuff to say that men can have babies. You know, I want to be kind, but that's stupid. It is just, it's ignorant, you know, and, and, it, and it, 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 it has no moral value to it whatsoever. And, and, and silly ideas need to be put away, put aside. But the reason, it's part of what I taught last week, what happened to us, why we got it, because we have, we have had a silent church for too long. And we've also at this point have a compromised church, I'm talking about churchianity in general. Mm -hmm. I wonder <coughs> what's going to happen when you consider 60 million Americans have been aborted over the last 49 years in one generation that it's happened. And then you have heard of the thing called the law of unintended consequences. There are side effects to this that nobody seemed to be thinking about when it, when it was happening, but it's interesting to me that the 1960s, 70s, you know, generation that put all of this in and pushed for all of it and so forth and rebelled against institutions and God and wanted free love and all the other kind of things, it's interesting to me that all those boomers now are in retirement age and coming into retirement, and it's also interesting to note that Social Security is not secure supposed to go bankrupt in another by 2030 uh, or so. Now, we'll, they'll figure something out, but you can't keep borrowing money and borrowing money and borrowing money. We're, we're on the verge of a collapse. And I would tell you it, it, it's part of why they're, they're trying to allow open borders and, and the craziness we have going on in our southern border. Part of it is we want to gain voters, but that's a whole side, side issue. But, the, but the, I think the underlying issue is we have a Social Security problem. We're wanting to bring in, and we've had about 5 million that have come in. We're wanting to bring these people in uh, from different cultures and, and give them uh, citizenship and all that so that they can begin to pay and help cover the, the uh, Social Security obligations. That's going to happen. Uh, we have a worker shortage in, in America that is really becoming a crisis. Sister Bell, uh, yeah, Sister Hines said, yeah, I can, I can start to call her Belgrove again. <laughs> I hear her saying amen. She, she was talking to me the other day about managing the store. She can't, can't, find, can't find people to come to work. I, I went through a, a drive through the other day with my wife. We were on our way somewhere. We just had want to get a sandwich for lunch, and I pulled up, and it took forever to get through, but we were stuck in line. So we get up there, and the woman's scrambling, and she just looked at us and said, I am so sorry. Nobody came to work today. And so she's in there trying to scramble everything and get things out the door. And, so, and, and the, you know, as a matter of fact, there's a crisis in home care for the aging. The same people that voted all this stuff in in their youth are now having trouble in their old age. Now, is that just irony? Or is it the result of the biblical law of sowing and reaping? Bring up slide four. I want to give you some abortion statistics, all right? And I'm just going to read this right out, right out of the report because, uh, and, and it's on there if you can read that. But uh, in the United States, there are three Mil, uh, uh, three million three, or I'm sorry, three thousand three hundred and fifteen abortions performed each day. In Virginia, 
19,724 women terminated their pregnancies in Virginia. In Southampton Roads, approximately 4,605 women had abortions, and of the, of the 21,000 total for the whole state. Why do women choose abortion? I'm just reading it right off the report. A recent study found 40% of women mention something about it being a financial issue. 36% say in some way they were discussing bad timing of the pregnancy. 31% mentioned raising a partner uh, issue. 29% said speaking of uh, difficulties with other children. 20% talked of the child somehow interfering with future plans or opportunities. Now listen very carefully. At the current rates, one of every three American women will have had an abortion by age 45. That's stunning. That's stunning. And you know, one of the reasons it's stunning is not only all the loss of life and all the loss of productivity and all the... You know, uh, Charles Spurgeon, when a great English preacher of the 18th century, he, he would walk in and he always... He would tip his hat to the children. So they always had the kids sit in one section in church over there. He would tip his hat all the time. He would, he would break off from the adults, go over to the children and tip his hat. And finally they asked him, Mr. Spurgeon, why do you do that all the time? And his answer was, because I don't know who's sitting in there. I could be tipping my hat to the next prime minister. I could be tipping my hat to the next great physician that comes up with a great cure. He said the potential of what's in that section is unbelievable. And most people are just ignoring it. But, but, but what, what did we kill in that 60 million? What brilliance never came to be? That's a sadness on its own. The other sadness is what it does psychologically to the women who have been through this. I heard the other day, you know, uh, a clip I saw, I should say, of Whoopi Goldberg, Goldberg fussing, you know, for the right to abortion. He even tried to claim it's a Christian right, you know, that somehow it's an about. That's nonsense, you know. And that show the view is, is an utter waste of, of time. Bunch of, a bunch of leftist nonsense. But the thing is, by Whoopi's own admission, if I understood right, she had seven abortions by the time she was in, reached 30 years old. I'm telling you, this stuff warps your psychology. Now listen very carefully. The African-American community represents about 12% of the United States population, yet they account for more than 35% of all abortions that happen in America. This is destroying the black community. More African Americans are killed by abortion than all other causes of death combined. And it's already been mentioned of how American slavery, of course it was a terrible, terrible time in our history, and it took a war to end it, and the nation was divided back in their time. There were people claiming to be Christian that were for it, which was ridiculous. They were misrepresenting the word of God. Just like there are people in our day that claim to be Christian that are misrepresenting the Word of God. It, the, the abortion is the modern-day version of what slavery was to the 18th century. There were, there were churches and Christians rising up against it all around, but it took, it took a war, a civil war, literally, to, to, to settle this issue. And, and it's amazing to me, as, it, as Prager noticed, the only culture in the world that did away with it was cultures that had a Judeo-Christian background. I would present to you that it was, it was biblical Christianity and the influence of it that, that in our founding documents that eventually won out. Did it take too long? Absolutely. Just like winning abortion has taken too long. But there are some things in our form of government you can't take away until you've been able to persuade enough people. In the end, it was a victory for Judeo-Christian values and principles. Now, I, I tell you how I feel. I don't, I've got only a few minutes left. And uh, turn, uh, bring up Hebrews 11 on the screen. Now, I, I want to say this, and I mean it very sincerely. I've got clips and, and notes, um, video clips. I've got research. But I could, I could literally sit here till midnight tonight and go on and on about stuff. But I think you get the point. I feel kind of like the Apostle Paul. He spent 31 verses trying to prove his point in Hebrews 11. And finally he says, and what shall I more say? 
for time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak. That's not Obama, by the way. And of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel and all the prophets. What, what, 31 verses of, of, of fighting for his point and finally just said, I could do this all night. He said, but time would fail me to do it. That's how I feel about this topic. I feel like time is failing me tonight. But I have enough documentation and clips. Again, I could keep, keep us busy for a while. And, and we could do this, but here's, here's really what it boils down for the church. The basic reality is that this is a, it, you have to decide what's the moral foundation that you're going to live by. We as the people of God, if we're, going to, if we're going to live as Christians and live as a biblical worldview, have got to take the sanctity of life serious because the, because the Lord said human life is valuable. And the basic moral foundation of abortion, in, in my opinion, and I think in biblical opinion, is not there. When you talk with friends or family and this issue comes up and you're just in I'm trying to give you some things to help you understand how to have a conversation, you know, with folks. And understand there's a lot of passion and stuff and, and yelling and screaming doesn't, that's not how you win an argument. And, but the real issue is not, not abortion. Steer them off of the idea of what's going on in the clinic and take it to what the real issue is. What is the value of life? And, and, and when they try to answer that, try to ask them, where did you get that answer from? Where, and there will be a lot of people, too. I don't know. A lot of people, unfortunately, got it from being deceived by media. Bring up Genesis 25 on screen. Another thing I want to show you, two things, and I'll, I'll begin to wrap. The Lord said unto her, this is, this is the, the Lord speaking to Rachel about Jacob and Esau. Two nations. Everybody say two nations. Where are they? In thy womb. God started talking about them before they even were born. Why? Because they had already been conceived. They already had been initiated new DNA by the God that created them. He was already breathing life into them. It was already there. The pregnancy was just the, the stage that you got to go through to get to birth. Just like when the baby's born, we got to raise them. Even when the baby's born, they're, they're not. You know, when, when they say, well, it's not viable, it's not viable. Well, I tell you what, if you leave a baby laying on a table and walk away from it, it's not viable either. They're not viable for a long time. You want to look at it that way. But look what the Lord said. Two nations are in their womb. Two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. It's going to be a messed up thing. <laughs> and when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. This was before ultrasounds <laughs> and the technology that we enjoy today. They didn't know until, you know, it got near birth time. But I, I'm pointing out that when God addressed it, he said he addressed it in the womb. One more scripture I want to end with. Uh, Psalms 139, bring up verse 13 on screen. For thou hast possessed my reins, the psalm said. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, that my soul knoweth right well. Stand with me tonight. I feel like as the people of God, our soul needs to settle this issue in our spirit. And I want to make clear what the teaching of this church. You know, the greatest, the greatest job that I ultimately have as bishop is I'm responsible for the, the pulpit of this church and for the doctrine that is presented and taught from it, or in this case, the music stand. can't wait till I get over this, get back in my pulpit again. <laughs> but, and, and what I've taught tonight, I'm presenting to you, that, that is the foundation of it. Now, we can, we can launch off into scientific discussion, medical things. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff and side roads you can take on all this, but it really just boils down to how do you value life. God's principles are greater than our circumstances. So even if we get ourselves in a circumstance of an unfavored pregnancy or surprise pregnancy or something that we didn't intend to say well you know there's a lot of things that happen in our life that are not intentional but the reality is we can't take 
lesser laws of our circumstance to override the greater laws that come from God. I say to the church and to the people of God and to those online and so forth, don't buy in to the abortion distortion that's going on in our world right now. Come back, bring your mind and your spirit and your family and your household back to the principles of the Word of God and adapt a biblical worldview to live by day by day. Amen? Amen. I hope this helped you and blessed you tonight. And uh, if you're interested in seeing any of those videos and others that are on it, just they're on YouTube. Our session will be. There's other videos there by Prager. Uh, good stuff. And it helps educate us so that we can uh, handle ourselves at the water cooler <laughs> and uh, represent the kingdom of God well. And remember, it doesn't matter if you're right with your facts if you're acting like a dingbat with your spirit. <laughs> so keep your spirit in order and represent the God that you're to be a reflection of into a lost world. Everybody across this house, lift your hands unto the Lord. Dear Jesus, I love you tonight, and I thank you for this service and for what I feel. By the authority of the Word of God and the power that is in the name of Jesus, I loose this teaching into this assembly. I'm asking you to bind this teaching into our minds and into our spirits uh, and put it in our hearts to allow us to, to, first of all, walk with you rightly on our own uh, and then also to help us, Lord, to be salt and light into a lost, crazy world that needs you in Jesus' name. I want everybody to clap your hands unto the Lord. And you know what I like to do. Let's end with a shout of praise. Glory! Glory! Amen. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord tonight. Be blessed in the name of the Lord. Well, there's uh, sub things going on in the next few days. Those are involved know what they are. But next Sunday morning and Sunday night, revival with Mike Easter. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Greet one another. Love one another. There is some, uh, uh, there's a lot of food that's back there tonight. There's vegetables and some things. Stop by the kitchen on your way out and grab you a cart full. God bless.